All right, hey, hey, y'all. So we're going to continue this talk of Colasso, or my sort of exploration of it. So Colasso, the most important thinker you've never heard of, at least I will say that anyways. For those that haven't checked out the first um, section I did or the first episode, a good way to uh, get caught up would just be to listen to... Um, Boy George's uh, Karma Chameleon, that uh, really does communicate the essence of this this song, of this, uh, this book, I should say. Uh, but on a more serious note, of course, uh, leading up to this point in this text, we are presented with uh, Talleyrand, the uh, French Napoleonic uh, thinker, or politician, who, at least according to Colasso, had some sort of understanding of the old order, or the old symbolic order, I will call it, where he had an understanding of the fragility of identity, how things can change and alter over time, and how that is absolutely okay. Whereas the other figures that were surrounded by him, or that surrounded him, were much more apt to believe that um, certain things were held to be universal truths, per se. So we go from Talleyrand and a, and a number of other figures. Reading this book is is rather difficult because even even me, I've, I've I don't know how many times I've read it now, but it's uh, there there are many um, literative, uh, many political allusions, many um, many figures that are presented that I'm not familiar with, and to read this, like even with Wikipedia open, uh, he presents people that you know, the internet doesn't even know about. So it can be quite difficult to engage with, and at times it's unclear as to whether or not Colasso is directly quoting certain people, or he's kind of nudging their personas in a certain way to fit his narrative, all like, you know, not to deceive the reader, but to, you know, make his point more clear. So he runs through a number of figures, including Talleyrand, that kind of evoke the same idea, up until he makes this kind of radical shift to the African kingdom of Kosh, where a kingdom is essentially sacrificed by sacrificing sacrifice. Where oh, I have two cats here fighting. Where uh, one of the main components that drives a civilization's ability to exist is its uh, relationship to sacrifice, at least sacrificing the king. And how, by eradicating that possibility, or by sacrificing that ability to sacrifice, what the natural outcome necessarily is. And for Colasso, it is, uh, or as he identifies it very properly, it marks a downfall of that civilization. Now, what he comes out of it, out of this saying, is that it does not necessarily mean that we see an end of sacrifice in this moment, but rather that even the institution of sacrifice must be challenged. It itself must be sacrificed in a sort of autoimmune type uh, capacity where it would be totally ironic if there was not one component of sacrifice, at least that thing that would destroy it, would not enter the system at some point. Because if we think of the body, the body is only properly able to defend itself against disease if it injects some component of that disease into itself in order to immunize or inoculate itself from it. So of course for more on that go check out the first one, the first uh, kind of talk I did, but really the best way would be to go check out the book, but it's kind of rare. It's uh, I think you, actually you could probably find it on Amazon, it might not be cheap though, uh, but yeah definitely read it. So now the next going into the next section we're going to deal specifically with sacrifice and what role it necessarily serves or what role it plays. So he begins this section by stating something that is would seem pretty intuitive and it's kind of surprising to hear him say but he says that the sacrificer and victim are two persons not one. This is the dazzling ultimate revelation concerning ourselves concerning our double I. So, even more, he says that the basis of sacrifice lies in the fact that each of one of us is two, 
not one. And that we are not a dense and uniform brick. So he's saying a number of things here, but there are two two key things that I want to kind of sift out. One of the one of them is that between the sacrificer and the victim, there are two people, and how each one of us is not one but is two. So each in, in his words, each one of us is two, not one. Which is interesting because you know it's implying something of a duality. But what this duality necessarily would look like, I think in this context, because he doesn't really go into detail as to what that means, where um, I can see his argument pertaining to the recognition of the sacrificer and the victim as being different, his suggestion that the human, the individual themselves is two, not one, is a little bit more complicated in this context, but I would go on so far as to propose that... Um, just like sacrifice must contain something of an element of its exterior in order to maintain itself, as we saw with the ruin of Kash, it has to be prepared to take on its opposite, in a sense. So in that way, I think we can kind of extend, kind of syllogistically, come to the conclusion that the human would fall under the same um, formula. And this is echoed in you know, uh, biopol biopolitical uh, theory with like Esposito and, and even Foucault a little bit. Uh, but in what way then is it necessary to include in this notion of the human its very opposite or its very antithesis? So our relationship to sacrifice or sacrifice in the most kind of literal sense where there is someone being killed, um, our relation to this has radically altered. So as he writes, History is also summed up in the fact that for a long time men killed other beings and dedicated them to an invisible power, but that, but that after a certain point they killed without dedicating the victims to anyone, did they forget? So I think we can see this as being correlative with the advent of modernity in some sense, where human lives are not uh, seen as being worthy in the under the gaze of some higher power. In fact, after killing gods, humans become much more disposable. Yeah, Steven Pinker's probably would hate to hear that, you know, because there's that general thesis that things have been, uh, violence is beginning less, but there's nothing to, to be said about how that violence is conducted and what that violence necessarily means or what death necessarily means. Where it is not so much a matter of how many people die, but it is... To what it, or for what purpose such people die, where if you, if you have a whole symbolic order around how death serves a certain function, and this is very much, um, take the, the Aztecs, for instance, where sacrifice was something that replenished the sun, um, death would not mean the same thing as it does today, so it wouldn't be something to look down upon and say that it would be something that we have to eradicate, something that we have to effectively conjure away to make ourselves more civil. However, when we take a step away from thinking about sacrifice as being the act of killing, for instance, uh, we can come to a certain interesting um, point where, as Colasso states, any act can be a sacrifice. Indeed, archaic society can be considered in its functioning as a perpetual sacrifice, a phrase that René Guénon coined and used it and used as if its meaning were transparently obvious. Since sacrifice is the ritual act par excellence, and all other acts share its nature and are somehow integrated with it, so that it necessarily determines the general structure of a traditional society. For this reason, we can say that everything in such a society truly constitutes a perpetual sacrifice. So we must be more uh, critical. We can't be so naive as to assume that sacrifice can only assume a single form where, you know, you have a person on an altar about to have their throat cut so the, the blood can spill uh, down the steps like that, that. That is a very limited way to understand the role of sacrifice where, for Colasso, a sacrificial act is any act in which the actor contemplates himself as he acts. The victim, the offering, is he who, who acts. The sacrificer is the eye that contemplates him. So there, we know all about this sort of um, this uh, this structure. If we, you know, we think of Foucault, for instance, 
in the panoptic gaze, there is very much a coming into being in the panoptic structure or the carceral state where people are rendered subject to a certain power and they are given um, like kids in a sandbox. They are allotted a certain degree of mobility only within the parameters of that <coughs> epoch or that episteme. But they are individuals nonetheless. They are individuals under the gaze of a certain uh, power. Now, what we see in this, at least, is, a, I think, a sacrifice of a, cert, of a, a possibility that can never truly be realized, notably uh, total emancipation. But it is that sort of perpetual form of sacrifice that I see uh, an indubitable affinity with, with how Colasso is laying it out. So we can see this as being a general transposition of the law of sacrifice onto uh, the, the modern age, right? So for that reason, Colasso is very clear that seen from the outside, the actions of the unenlightened, though obeying the ritual order, cannot be distinguished in any way from those in the enlightened. Precisely because something as sacred as sacrifice, something as sacrosanct, something as important to... I guess giving humans some degree of meaning in this world uh, cannot simply be exercised. It will retain its form. It will retain its ability to function in some form or other. Now, let it be made clear that Colasso does hold his reservations about uh, the possibility to realize any of the components of the old ritual order or the old symbolic order in this uh, in this formation of society that dominates today or has dominated for a, a great deal of time. So to emphasize this point, he brings up uh, Simone Vai. So Simone Vai was a French thinker, a mystic. She wrote, um, oh my god, the root, uh, root uh, the need for roots, uh, where she kind of outlined the importance of people to have a fundamental connection to their territory, to their nation, to their identity in a sense, lest they be uh, susceptible to uh, to a certain nothingness, which can then o usher in the open up the floodgates for so, uh, totalitarian regimes to kind of flow in. So what Classo says about that is that in Simon Vai we have the first revolt against the secular form of religion, a revulsion parallel to that which Lucretius felt when he saw the blood of four-footed creatures spilled copiously over the altars. Vai was the first to recognize the most insidious peculiarity of the social. The mystery through which there there exists an apparent kinship between the social and the supernatural. She was the first to affirm that because of this kinship, the only idolatry is that which bows before society, and the only enslavement is enslavement to society. So one of those things that stands with with society in that way, and is then able to communicate uh, or perpetuate this very oppressive framework is science. As just one thing, something that Simon Vai was very uh, a weary of, and of which Colasso writes that science wants only one kind of gift. It wants veritable facts, which can be tested in controlled settings and replicated. An idea that was not uh, held prior to this age, whatever it is that we're really dealing with here. And it is part of that system that seeks to purge the world of its mystery, purge the world of its... I guess, um, illusion. So it's from here Colasso begins to think about uh, the way in which social organization works. So in order to do this, he points to two fundamental, <coughs> I guess, two structures, that is law and order, where these two things are not, uh, they cannot be exchanged. They cannot be, uh, the terms are not interchangeable. Because for Colasso, the word order does not repeat does not echo the meaning of law. Order is law plus sacrifice. So just because we might have a law does not mean that we will have order. Just because we have institutions that might seek to maintain the law does not mean that the people will follow that. So order, that end point of law, is only possible if it is, um, it, if it is, my god, if it is wrapped up with sacrifice, or if sacrifice is included within it. So sacrifice is that thing, as we understand it, 
uh, at least according to Colasso, that part of the human condition or part of social organization that gives us these roots that operate in some sense to attach us to something, right? It, in, it elevates us to a higher order, which is, I, I'm not going to poke holes in this now because it would take too long, but it's that thing that essentially brings people together, right? And I, I, a good way to think about this would be um, uh, the, uh, the Avengers, the with uh, Thanos, so the latest one, where his uh, essentially his argument is that if half of the people are killed, um, then the rest of the half will have enough resources to keep living happily and fruitfully. Where I think it's much deeper than that, in that if you have half of the people be killed, suddenly all the rest can crowd together uh, against a single source of power, right? All the people are then have a common enemy. And it is their having a common enemy that brings them together in a sense. So if you have a, an institutional framework like sacrifice that sees people that is very much in the control of removing people from the earth for the sake of a higher order, you can have people obviously organize around that. Not to say that they will resist it very explicitly, but that there will be an attachment to its power or a certain interest of fascination with it. So to return to law and order, we can effectively say then that where there is law, there is not necessarily order, but there cannot be order without law. Moreover, there can't be order without law and sacrifice because order would imply that there is, either written down or not, uh, a set of customs or beliefs that reign in any sort of given social organization, which we can simply subsume under the title of law. Now, ours is a society that seeks to purge the need for sacrifice, the need for the symbolic in the construction of order, where for Colasso, as he states, the West chose a single thread which it wanted to separate from all the others, the expulsion of the sacred through the killing of the sacrificial victim. So to be born omenless, unshadowed by guilt or grace, is our original modern status. The unexpected demand that we rid ourselves of the world, a demand lurking behind every shop counter, lab laboratory table, professor's desk, cash register. This is sort of the consequence of a hyper-materialism that doesn't see the possibility of there being any sort of connection to a symbolic realm like what what would that look like to a hardcore materialist that would simply point to uh, the table being the table right and as far as analyzing the table would go would go down to the means of production you know it's just one possible way to look at it so class was not interested in any of that because he sees there being at least through the course of history a necessary connection to things that we cannot necessarily see or explain but that we give ourselves over to, which today we try to purge by being born omenless. So we are effectively afraid of the symbolic because it's something that we cannot explain. So the entire sociological projects to emerge out of the 19th and 20th centuries, thinking of Durkheim or Freud or anything like that, are all very uh, circular in their logic where they can explain something like, at least according to Colasso, killing essentially why do people kill and you can point to a whole series of sociological analyses or or i guess observations that would give us a, an answer or something of an answer but what cannot be explained is killing or it's death itself and what role that necessarily serves in the communication or in the maintenance of some higher order but as I've made clear, it's not as though sacrifice can be completely purged. Or as Colasso writes, when a laboratory explodes, the memory of sacrifice is revived. Where it is that sort of unknown element entered into the world, like the laboratory, the site of a hyper-rational order, can still be at the whim of mysterious accidents that cannot be necessarily explained. Or they can if you, you know, people want to really find out. But it still maintains something, at least Colasso says kind of poetically, 
it maintains the possibility of the unknown seeping into our the unbearable lightness of our civilization today. Now one of the really interesting changes that Colasso notes is that in the age of, I guess, the modern, or in modernity, uh, the sacrificed person, because they lose an identity, and this the affinities between all of what Colasso does here and Baudrillard are really uh, clear, and they're really prominent, yet neither in all their books, I haven't read all of Colasso's yet, but in the however many I have read, no, Baudrillard does not come up at any point, but they were talking about the same thing very much. They were, that was a terrible sentence. So Colasso states that the sacrificial victim undergoes something of a a, a reproduct oh, Jesus a reproduction where they are made to be a simulation of themselves. So pure exchange with which syste- systematizes substitution gradually expels uniqueness the vestige of the primordial victim. In the end, the world will be inhabited only by substitutes, hence by victims unaware that they are victims, because the irreplaceable priest who raises the knife over them has no name and no shape. So Baudrillard essentially makes the exact same claim in Fatal Strategies, where we see a loss or, um, I guess, a dissipation of identity in the wake of, you know, the simulated type apparatuses that guide identity. But for Colasso here, this marks a fundamental shift or something of an end to the notion of sacrifice as it can manifest itself in the, I guess, traditional way, where you have a priest killing a a sacrificial victim. Because the meaning associated with people has been effectively lost, right? So we think of Benamine in the age of mechanical reproducibility, we can lose, things can lose their aura. I don't think humans are necessarily outside of that framework. In fact, we would do well to kind of associate the two, right? And say that humans can undergo this sort of reproducibility to the same extent that art can. So to make up for the loss of meaning associated with the sacrificial victim, we compensate by adding more people, right? So hence mass scale wars, hence the world wars, where people were thrown into trenches, thrown into camps, essentially to demonstrate their loss of identity, and sacrificed to something of a higher order. A sacrifice that could have been done at one point with just a single victim, or could have manifested itself in some other form, thinking about the idea of the gift here. But it is not something that can be reclaimed in in modernity per se. So for Colasso, now the ritual involves more than a single wretched being. An entire generation of anonymous men is exalted to the status of noble victim and lowered into the pits, which have been transformed into trenches. So in in following with the aphoristic form of this book, Colasso goes to an interesting place. And it. I'm wondering if anyone has any possible insight as to why. So he goes to a moment in Goethe's life, notably one of his birthdays, where there's a dialogue between Goethe and and a friend of his. So Goethe, dear friend, what day is this, and what is the date? Rebain, which is his friend, it's August 27th, Excellency. No, it's the 28th, and it's my birthday. No, no, I would never forget that. It's the 27th. That's not so. It's the 28th the 27th. Then Goethe rings uh, another friend, what's the date? The 27th, Excellency. Go to, bring me the calendar. Carl, one of his other friends, brings Goethe the calendar, the calendar, the calendar, and says, Goethe, to which Goethe replies, damn, then I got drunk for nothing. So leading up to this, Goethe was in a room where he had uh, one of his servants, I guess, bring up to bottles of wine and he placed each on either side of his room and what he would do is pace from wall to wall each time arriving at one wall and taking a swig of wine going back doing another so it's it's really quite like it, it just seems so out of place for him to include this 
And there's really no context added that would give us any hint as to why it fits in with this whole discussion around sacrifice. And it it's really strange. So I just thought I'd bring that up in case anyone has read this and would know why. Uh, this would be easier with another person. But I'm, it's curious nonetheless, but I'll, I'll move on. In this giant apparatus of control, Colasso sees that technology takes on something of a sacrificial role, where at one time sacrifice was intended to ward off unknown bouts of violence or famine or drought, anything like that. Now technology performs the exact same function, where technology takes the place not of magic but of sacrifice. Like sacrifice, it is chiefly a way to control danger. Now at what cost, I might ask? Because it, it of course... Colasso would have his reservations about it, and we can't be too eager to just input onto this social organization or in this system a sort of extension of the sacrificial design, even though that is what I would, in my heart of hearts, is what I might I might argue. But there is something of an oppressive uh, application to this technological apparatus. And I think that is because technology is reaching a degree of perfection where everything will come to the point where it can be explained, where even when things were organized by sacrifice, there were still random flare-ups of mystery, of, of imagination, of illusion that could not be explained. Now we are developing tools, linguistic and otherwise, you know, technological or technical, to explain virtually every single aspect of our lives or of the world. And this moves us into one of the following chapters titled Limits, where technology sees no fundamental limit, which is one of the components of life itself or of, or of um, social organization. So for Colasso, the history of the Enlightenment serenely denies limits. So one way to think about this, and this is the illusion that he, he provides here, and we must keep in mind... Uh, what he was saying at the first in the first half of this book about Talleyrand and the fragility of identity, Colasso provides us with the image of a of a picture. So a picture is within a frame. Now the way in which people can analyze the and of course all this has come into question with in recent years, but for now let's just assume. So within the frame, a picture can be changed, can be swapped out, or if you have the same image, it can be analyzed from any number of perspectives. But what remains the same, what remains territorial in a sense, is the frame. So the frame comes to represent something of a limit. Now in the uh, quote-unquote postmodern era where we have, you know, um, images bursting out of frames, right, as a means to demonstrate something of, a, of an emancipation, of a transcendence, of a circumvention of limits, we see something that it's not that doesn't sit quite right with uh, Colasso. And we can hear Marx uh, resonating through here, even though Colasso comes to challenge Marx. And we think of the Gundrissa, where, you know, uh, Marx says the capital cannot cannot abide by a limit, right? Capital is one of those components that just sees endless proliferation. Now, where, Mar where Colasso moves away from Marx is that Colasso is not prepared to say that a limit can possibly be reclaimed. We are always driving, in a sense, to circumvent or transcend limits, although even in the mode of sacrificial uh, exchange or symbolic exchange, to a lesser extent, I would, I would say, but it is still there nonetheless, where any sort of limit can be possibly transcended, circumvented, through the process of sacrifice. So from here, we'll get into Colasso's critique of Marx, which is, uh, it's pretty brutal because it's, <laughs> the title is chapter, it, title, the chapter is titled Glosses on Marx, as though he doesn't even want to really give Marx all that much attention. So of Marx, he says, we must remember is above all greedy. He wants more of everything, which leads Colasso or allows Colasso to say that socialism or the end product of socialism is simply an extension of capitalism, is very much the mirror of production because of how he um, illustrates Marx here. Moreover, looking to the origins, Marx regarded the earth in two different ways, 
It was at, at, at once an extension of the body of man and his great laboratory, arsenal, working material. These antithetical modes recur often in his thought. On the one hand, there is an analogical chain of symbolic correspondences in which the earth is enfolded as, so, enfolded as soon as it is considered an extension of the body of man, and thus we see that despite incessant secularization, terms like heart, brain, flesh remain symbolic poles. On the other hand, there is an enlightenment-inspired dissociation, an experimental use of the whole, an absence of premises, represented in the image of the great laboratory. And this, this really resonates throughout many of, like, I think of Rosa Luxemburg as well, uh, but especially this discourse around scientific socialism, which Calasso would clearly have a problem with because it wouldn't necessarily be, it would be a foreclosure or a foreclosing of the possibility of the symbolic, whatever that might look like, in favor of a sort of scientific rationality that would input onto the human basic needs, values, um, that that can essentially be homogenized and that can be disseminated to everyone, which precludes the possibility that things can change over time, or that even, as we saw in the um, the story of Kash, can itself be sacrificed and must itself be sacrificed. So far as development is concerned, according to Calasso. Marx ultimately became more capitalist than capital itself. Sharp-eyed and obstinate, he looked everywhere for the limits of the power that demolishes limits. So in a sense, he wanted to get beyond the system itself, and in doing so, he could only be even more indoctrinated into it. In, into it. And in lieu of it, he wants to design a better machine, which will demolish limits without ever jamming, without crises. Like a great mechanic, he has a loving, passionate knowledge of the capitalist machine. And that is really, like the socialist ideal certainly would rely on that. If it is to be effective, it must in some sense retain the possibility of circumventing limits because this, humans are not a homogenous mass, as Calasso made clear at the beginning of where I started here, where every human is not one but two, and no peoples are one but many, it would be impossible for their, them to be subsumed under a single homogenizing factor system. Now, of course, we would do well not to just take Colasso as being the uh, last voice or the last word pertaining to Marx, and there are still many things to get from it, but he does raise an interesting point, and certainly to limits of uh, Marx's project, or at least how he was envisioning a challenge to capital. So in that way, there is something to take from it, but like everything else, we must be prepared to challenge it as hard as he, as hard, as diligently as he challenges Marxism. And instead of Marx, uh, Calasso proposes that we think of someone else. So before that, he writes that today's world derives from Marx, Freud, and Nietzsche, who were, after all, respectable individuals who cared about the about good manners and knew very well that such manners should be kept, even if crit even if critique of the existent could should finally abolish them. But it seems to an even greater degree and unwittingly from Max Stirner. So Max Stirner is a key figure for Colasso, and Stirner is someone that is not so naive as these other thinkers. And the Marxists would surely want to rip out their brains or rip out their hair and, and throw their brains at me for saying this, but um, or at least paying heed to some to Colasso saying this. But Stirner provides something of a useful antidote to the humanism, to the homogenizing tendency found in Marxist thought. So as Colasso writes, Stirner is the barbarian who comes from one of Germany's provincial little states and bursts into the center of the metaphysical empire. So he goes on to say that Stirner's egoist denies all dependence, but every sort of dependence is a root, terrestrial or celestial. So he's thinking about uh, um, Stirner's The Ego and Its Own, a book often challenged for being uh, an ultra-libertarian type um, uh, view sympathetic of 
in advanced capitalism. But it is an interesting one nonetheless, and Colasso continues here, saying that the egoist is an uprooted man who for the first time recognizes himself as such. He roams the cities, a complete stranger to everyone and everything. The words that invade his mind, the desires that assail him, everything is something that he can use or throw away. The only thing that is his own is the act of taking or chasing away. He is the man from underground who plunders metaphysics. So as I've been saying, uh, Colasso identifies in Stirner's premise the process, that the process of secularization is unable to consume or extinguish the sacred as it claims to do. It merely shifts it, and the power that it assumes is all the more devastating and uncontrollable since it no longer has a name and cannot be recognized for what it is. So, and I'm going to read a rather long passage here, even a small amount of Stirner's prussic acid would be enough to produce incurable spasms in the mighty torso of the worker, that deplorable anthropological figment on whom Marx and Engels built their labor practices, which the fervent engineers of the soul would eventually replace with different ones. In the molten lead that flowed from Stirner's book, in its obsessive repetitions and unseemly arguments, Marx and Engels, who now claimed to speak for all workers, saw the emergence of a different and fearsome mass of proletarians, not Pelisa de Val Volpedo's workers, striding proudly to be gunned down by mustachioid officers, but the infernal, shapeless mass of the lumpen, incorrigible vagabonds, incapable of class loyalty, rootless from the womb, violent, inarticulate, disrespectful enemies of labor and learning, those whom the newspapers called, with a shudder, the dregs of society. It was the underground emerging into the open, and this ghostly reserve army threatened to stifle the proletariat before the proletariat could snuff out the bourgeoisie. So this class of society, those people that fall outside of the purview of Marx's, Marx and Engels' framework, those people that are not actually interested in being indoctrinated into an organizable society, or as Colasso says of Marx and Engels, who did their best, that did their best to disguise the fact that their ultimate criterion for the human was its organizability, these people that fell outside of that framework, not necessarily because they were left behind by society, but simply because society is an impossible ideal, where contemporary rhetoric around uh, indoctrinating everyone into some kind of social mode, you know, as, as uh, a betterment of society, a sort of um, uh, kind of rendering them comatose and feeding them society in kind of these homeopathic doses, stripping them of any sort of agency in favor of being functional, properly socialized beings is of no interest to Colasso. Right. What he wants is to consider that there are people simply that always fall outside of the auspices of society because society is not um, as universal as it claims to be. In fact, it only communicates very specific ideals that, thank God, people still challenge or not challenge willingly, but fall outside of. Otherwise, I would suggest that we'd fall into an even more oppressive schema schema schematic so sterner sort of works as an antidote to this because he takes account or he counts for the individual in some way the individual that stands outside of society so superstitious and clear-sighted marx feared the power that comes with the loss of class a power that always casts a shadow over the proletariat's radiant ascents radiant ascents a person who loses class does not move from one class to another, rather he moves from a class with its distinctive customs and dress to an unspecified place that has no shape or affiliations, a place that is no longer inside but opposite society. So for, the, for him, for Colasso, for Stirner, this comes down to the individual. So this is an individual cut loose from everything, who is no longer a material that can be easily shaped or organized. At most, it might give rise to the terrorist, that person that stands radically opposed to the possibility of being subsumed under any kind of class category, be that of the proletariat, the worker, the bourgeois, anything of that sort, and opens up the complex 
the complexities of any such identity categories. So Stirner's individual is that is whom eludes the domesticated canon of the human, which humanist torturers, cultivators of science and common sense, try to impose on people, convinced they are doing good. And this is very indicative of the project of modernity to kind of wrest people away from the possibility of a sort of indeterminacy, of an indeterminacy in their identity, and to ground them, ground them in, in this case, in class, and how that identity then determines them wholly, how they cannot be anything outside of that. And in this way, Stirner is much more closer affiliated with Nietzsche. So Nietzsche is thinking about the Uberman or, you know, the, the will to power or anything like that really resonates well with Stirner's ideas that he presents here, or at least that Colasso identifies. And he brings up a, a, a point that um, can be found in Ida Overbeck, when Nietzsche worries that perhaps he, he will be, um, or goes as follows, uh, Stirner. Now this is Nietzsche. Sterner, with him, yes. A grave expression darkened his face, and as I looked attentively at his features, they changed again. He waved his hand as if to drive away or repel something and murmured, Now I've told you. Now I don't want to speak of it. Forget it all. They will talk of plagiarism, but I know you won't. That is, because Sterner has such an affinity with, with Nietzsche's thought, whom he didn't want to, you know, really recognize, and it's kind of jokingly playful in this way. But there are... This is just to illustrate the kind of similarity. So if anyone is thinking Nietzsche when they hear Stirner and how he's being described, then of course you, you, you are right. Now this is only further emphasized when we consider Marx's disdain for those unproductive workers or those people that felt like they could be outside of society or the proper functioning of society, which is only really possible once a kind of scientific apparatus, i.e. the discovery of a sort of scientific socialism allows for the justification of society to be made like a finality, as it is in uh, Marx here. So the, for Colasso, the blind rage that Marx directs at the lumpen, so lumpen, lumpen those, those workers or those people that fall under the kind of Sternian matrix of identity, continues in his anger at unproductive workers, which is ironic. It seems as though it would, this is an in Marx's project, an extension of production, right? So these critiques are leveled in um, in Baudrillard's The Mirror of Production, pointing to the limits of Marx's analysis to actually challenge our obsession with production and how Marx essentially takes production to its nth power, suggesting that it can reach a final point where it will kind of plateau and everyone's needs will be met but it's a very impossible standard and it would demand the circumvention of infinite number of barriers to just reach that point, which is just pie in the sky, at least for Colasso here. Now I want to turn to Colasso's thinking about the really the present day. And I, I really skip over a lot because he, he goes from place to place thinking about different kind of figures in the political uh, spheres of the past millennium almost uh, but or even more than that so it, it'd be impossible to present everything it would really take it would so many hours uh, so I want to jump to his thinking about the role of, of terrorism in response to this kind of Western envelopment of the world so Colasso says that when the Islamic summons to holy war rings out in Iran, it will be one of the many farces and endless misunderstandings provoked by the West's envelopment of the world. So terrorists hijack airplanes or merely blow up airline offices thousands of kilometers away from the enemy. Such actions sarcastically remind us that the nomos has been completely uprooted from any soil and that today's order rests on nothing and hence has no borders. But they also imply that at any moment and in whatever place, the killing of some hostess and justice, predetermined or chosen at random, belongs to the events of the theater of war. And that this, I guess, the spectacle of terrorism in this way only corresponds with that idea of the West or of the United States specifically. So, for Colasso, one day the United States discovered that it was an empire, but it didn't know what an empire was. It thought that an empire was merely the biggest of all corporations, 
or that very extension of this logic, at least indicative of America, onto those po points of resistance to that very oppressive framework. So we find ourselves today in a sort of uh, oppressive democracy, kind of the end point, like Plato really did predict many of the things that would occur if we were to really, uh, if we were to just follow democratic rule, where, as Colasso states, one of democracy's achievements, extending to everyone the privilege of access to things that no longer exist. So it is for this reason, I think, that what he has to say about terrorism as being only part of the very system that it seeks to challenge, just as Marxism is to capitalism, is that it does not recognize that there is no kind of outside to it. Like this total, whole totalizing framework has, in a sense, succeeded. But I want to make clear, I don't think that this means that there's nothing that can be done, but rather many of the ways that we envision a possibility of challenging or resisting the system only plays into it in some form or other. For example, if we were to posit something of a Colasso-like uh, alternative, it would account for sacrifice. And for us to propose sacrifice be returned, we would be met with pretty odd looks, precisely because that doesn't fit into the cultural logic of the system in which we find ourselves, yet it is wholly necessary, and it is still here in some ways. People don't want to hear that, you know, uh, science is just an extension of superstition or religion. That That's an idea that that can't be said. But they do not want to hear the possibility of death having something of a productive function. Death not only in the uh, biological body or the, in terms of the physiological, but rather the death of ideas, the death of even sacrifice itself. Rather ironically, if we consider again the story of Kash. So it's from here, and I'm like, there's so much that I gloss over, but it's here that I'll kind of wrap it up, and I'll bring back Talleyrand, and that's precisely what, or it's exactly what Colasso does. Bringing back Talleyrand and his knowledge of, I guess, the fragility of identity or anything like that, that allowed him to have the upper hand in terms of social, I guess, know-how or, or knowledge. And this is because Talleyrand, like Stirner, for Colasso, when they came out into the open, both found themselves obliged to forge ahead into a dizzying nothingness. Stirner belonged to nothingness from the beginning and was to represent it in all its purity and claims to absoluteness. Talleyrand's nothingness was born of his exclusion from his natural position, which for him continued to exist amid all the upheavals it was a legitimate place, representing an order that neither storms nor rebellions could disturb. He never lapsed, however, into the crude naivete of thinking that order could be identified with some social system, which is precisely why he was able to be, at least according to Colasso, as successful as he was, as almost everything he did, politician in, in politics in the church, uh, with, well, relationships to some extent. And it is that, I guess, it, 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 this is kind of like a um, self-help book in some way, where you can take from it kind of a strategy of indifference or a strategy of apathy that teaches us to take the world not quite as seriously as, you know, we're taught to with, with all the rhetoric that floats around today, and especially not to take ourselves as seriously. And I think it can be kind of therapeutic in that way to think about, you know, how small we are, how infinitesimal we are in relation to everything else. And this book is just one perfect example of that, because reading it, it's really a monolith. It's, it's, it's kind of long, 350 pages or so, but the number of references is, is I get it's head spinning, or makes your head spin, and it's difficult to trace them all out, and you really feel like, I feel really inferior to uh, to this text itself, let alone Colasso, who's really, he's still alive, too. He's, he's still writing. He has a couple books out now in Italian that I haven't read because I don't know Italian, but hopefully those will get translated soon. But for those people that made it through all this, um, if you haven't read this book, I'd highly, highly, highly recommend it. It is by no means accessible to 
it's a very challenging book and it's, it's very enigmatic it's like i haven't read anything quite like it like it i guess a, a thousand plateaus would be close i prefer this but just the sheer magnitude of it is really what is brilliant but really for those who made it this far i hope you got something from this uh, i know this was kind of an esoteric choice of mine to look at or book to look at but i hope it'll you know point some people in Colasso's direction and get more people reading him because he's really an unknown at least in in um uh canada the united states most of europe like i don't think anyone takes him seriously or even knows who he is but anyways for anyone who made it this far 